Nick, Google, Google Nick. I'll do that again. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming by. My pleasure. Um, we're, from oh, the, we're up in Jesus. the San Francisco office. We're on the Jumbotron. Yeah, there are folks uh, from other offices who I think are just um, peeking in. I like a higher angle, sir. <laughs> um, so Nick's in town uh, in Northern California just to stop through to, uh, usually you come through to pick up wood, but this time you're actually coming through to uh, for kind of dual reasons. One is for, you have an American ham show tonight. That's right. And then uh, there's also a premiere of Somebody Up There Likes Me tomorrow night. Tomorrow at the Roxy. And how many American ham shows has it been so far? I think it's about four dozen. Uh, I got invited last year, about a year ago, to speak at some colleges. And I thought, um, by God, I have some things I'd like to say to the young people. And so I wrote this show, and it was really fun, and uh, then more colleges invited me, and then the show ended up being kind of humorous. So uh, then w we turned it into a real show, and now I'm just playing like legit theaters, like the Masonic Center this evening. And it's also been super fun because my wife has a new band called Nancy and Beth, and they're about as entertaining as anything I've ever seen, and so they've been opening for me. And it's quite a, uh, quite a package. <laughs> and it, is it something that you had always wanted to do as far as a kind of a one man? Because you, you're not a stand-up comedian as such. No, yeah, I'd never, I'm a, I'm a trained theater actor. I never dreamed that I would perform as myself. Um, is that tough? Is it hard to play yourself? Well, no, because as my dad always said, I have a good line of bullshit. Um, <laughs> My, my grandpa was the mayor of my small town in Illinois, and my, my dad is also kind of a farmer politician. Um, so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't too freaked out. I think if somebody said, I need you to go do an hour of stand-up, that would make me scared because I don't think I'm particularly much of a joke writer. I put together a show uh, that's 10 Tips for a Prosperous Life, and then I laced it with uh, things that make people laugh and it seems to be working out. But I, I always say that I'm a humorist and not a stand-up. And then over the course of the year or the, and plus that you've been doing this, do you, uh, do you make adjustments to the show? Is it kind of originally what it was and it still is, or is it...? Uh, uh, the skeleton remains the same, the, the 10 tips, and, and the, you know... The, if I do a tight version of the show, it's about 90 minutes, but usually uh, it comes in over two hours because... I am known to run off at the mouth uh, on something that strikes my fancy. Um, so every, every show has about 30 or 40 minutes of unique material that I pull straight out of my ass. Well, it's nice that it's your show, so it's your prerogative, too, actually. It is. It's, re it's really fun. Uh, and everyone seems to have a pretty good time, unless they're faking it. Now, as far as uh, the fact that you've been an actor, originally coming from a theater background, now you're a writer and now a producer with somebody up there likes me. How did that come to be? Um, I guess organically. Uh, I, I've always, uh, I've always, I guess, written f things that I, you know, little stupid funny things. There's a great group uh, from the Bay Area, and I think they were prevalent in the 70s, maybe into the 80s, called the Fire Sign Theater. And when I was in college, they were like a, a radio play group, um, but, but sort of a pot-smoking version of a, a radio play group. And they're super, super funny. Uh, they, had, they had, I don't know, five or six albums that were, that were a big deal. And I was very inspired by them. So when I was in college, I wrote some stuff kind of emulating that, uh, that medium. And I've always been a big fan of Garrison Keillor. Um, but even on my show, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm by far the, the one who's always pitching a lot of, uh, you know, for, for better or worse, I'm always pitching stuff for everybody to say, <laughs> which I think some people like and some people might find irksome. Um, but so then eventually my boss asked me to write an episode, which, which was really fun. Uh, and this friend of mine uh, that I've worked on a bunch of films with asked me to produce this film that we're opening at the Roxy tomorrow night. Somebody up there likes me. Um, 
And it's all just very organic. And then this year, my boss also asked me to direct an episode of Parks and Rec. And they, they don't come about because they're things that I aspire to do. They just come about because uh, we love collaborating as a group. And there's a, you know, uh, my, my boss decided he thought it would be funny to see if I could write one. Um, or, or when my, my friend wanted me to produce this movie, he, it wasn't that I had any, uh, any kind of resume as a producer. He just thought that my energy and work ethic would help. Um, and it's a small crew. It's, it's 20, 24 people. It's a very low-budget movie. And so I was a very creative producer. We had a second producer named Hans Grafunder who worked on The Sopranos, and now he produces for Terrence Malick, who's an up-and-coming filmmaker you'll be hearing more about. Um, and he's, he's the dad. He ran the office. He did all the paperwork. He knew where to find all the money we needed. And I like helped the wardrobe ladies carry clothes from their car <laughs> to the set. And I, I, was on, I ran the set, and he ran the office. So I kind of learned uh, how I am a producer as I did it. And, and having those dual roles, so not just being a producer, but actually being a lead in, in it, is it difficult to, to, or how is that different than just you know, having one role on, say, parks or in theater? Well, the, the downside of directing or producing is that they want you to pay attention to the whole goddamn thing, um, which takes a lot more <laughs> energy than just working as an actor. Um, I, I don't think I would want to, I don't know if I, I would want to produce or direct something uh, that I had a really huge role in, you know, e even though I, ha I have a leading role, I, I don't have like long monologues or, you know, any days that are particularly strenuous beyond standing in the right place and making funny faces. Um, so uh, I, I don't, I, I think if somebody wanted me to direct myself playing Hamlet, I'd probably Demir, or at least get a co-director, get, get my wife signed up. And as far as roles that you really think you'd like to tackle in the future, are there ones, whether they're theater, whether film, that you'd like to take on? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, um, I don't really fit the mold to play someone like Hamlet uh, or some of the greater leading man roles. Wouldn't mind taking a crack at Rosencrantz or Guildenstern. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm keen to do something with the, the role of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I think that would be a lot of fun. My friend Conan O'Brien really wants to produce something uh, in the realm of, of Teddy Roosevelt, but we can't, we're talking about <laughs> we can't figure out what to do because we can't really do something serious with, and have his, his and my name on it and be like, a dead serious biopic brought to you <laughs> by the funniest tall redhead well, ever created. Well, isn't John Stewart actually now directing something serious? Maybe he's leading the charge. You guys oh, maybe, get, yeah, maybe. Know, blowing his wake. Maybe we'll. Who knows? I mean, it's something we talk about a lot. I don't, I don't know if it'll come to pass, but um, there's there's a, a lot of a lot of roles like that. There, there's this great character Ernest Shackleton, who uh, Kenneth Branagh beat me to, but. Maybe uh, maybe that'll fade from memory soon enough that I can I can take him on. He he, had, he led an incredible uh, South Pole expedition in the in the very early 20th century or late 19th century. Um, but there, there's a lot of, of roles like that. I'm I'm not a uh, I'm not particularly ambitious. I I like uh, seeing what comes down the pike. It sounds like somebody up there like me likes me is is something that both because you were asked and actually kind of the genesis for it started out here, right? Just kind of outside of this building almost. Well, yeah. The um, I, I the last time actually I was a lead in a film was this movie called Treasure Island, and it's it's set in 1943 and it's based uh, when when it was a naval base out there on Treasure Island. Uh, and the movie looks like it was made in, in the early 40s. We shot it actually on a period camera called a Mitchell. The filmmaker was uh, a, a very wonderfully weird, old-timey, like uh, meticulous filmmaker. 
and it's a it's a delightfully difficult film. It's it's like if David Lynch made a made a film in 1941. Uh, there's a lot of kick-ass sex in the movie, <laughs> but we sh we shot a scene right out by the fire department down there on the water. There's like a piece of decrepit pier. We we shoot a pivotal scene with the Bay Bridge in the background and. We got them to turn the lights on in the middle of the scene, which was very exciting for us. It was one of my most Michael Bay moments <laughs> I've had to date. And then that led to a friendship that then evolved into... Yeah, Bob Byington, this filmmaker uh, who, who, who wrote and directed Somebody Up There Likes Me, was the script girl on Treasure Island, and that's where we met. Uh, and we, we liked the cut of, of one another's jib. Uh, his writing is really smart and funny, and he has a great dry sense of humor. So he, he kind of kept me around. I, I, uh, every couple of years, I would fly myself to Austin and do a couple scenes in his movies, and um, he finally wrote me a, a nice big part and then asked me to produce it. And that's coming out tomorrow. Well, it's already come out, but it's being premiered tomorrow in San Francisco. Yeah, we're having a big event. Uh, I'm going to be at all the screenings at the Roxy tomorrow, I, and I believe I'm giving away a, an Offerman Woodshop mustache comb <laughs> at each of three Q&As. And speaking of woodworking, as long as you went there, um, you know, oftentimes you, I think you come up, you said, to Northern California to, to um, pillage our wood and, and bring it down to turn it into to whatever kind of catches your fancy. As you've evolved and have your own woodworking shop, you know, where does it kind of chainsaw sculpture fall in the pantheon? Is that something you think you might tackle? Uh, no, never. Um, <laughs> I, I have a few very large chainsaws that I, I love to use, but um, I don't... Uh, I, there, there's actually a few small tools known as power carvers that are like a little uh, right angle grinder, but they have a little circular chainsaw head on them. And uh, carving with a machine, I'm not much of a carver to begin with, but carving with a machine doesn't, doesn't uh, appeal to me. If I was ever gonna try carving, I, I would do, I mean, the, what little carving I've done, I do with gouges and I do it by hand. And you have something that you eventually are gonna kind of be working towards your Rachmaninoff you know, three that you're big. Um, woodworking is something I, I, I love doing and I, I hope to continue to improve at uh, for the rest of my life. Um, I don't have like, you know, I, I suppose a pipe dream would be to build like, maybe a, a wooden sailboat uh, before I'm done, but nothing too big because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to ruin my marriage. Um, <laughs> But I, I, right now we're getting ready to, to build some ukuleles in the shop, and that's uh, we love the ukulele, but it's also with an eye towards trying some acoustic guitars. Um, if we if we you know get any good at that, maybe we'll try some other instruments. I d I have the luxury of uh, because I I have a nice waitress job um, during the daytime. I don't have to make kitchens for people uh, with my shop, and I can kind of pick and choose what I want to make. So I want to try some stringed instruments. Uh, I always hope to build more boats. Those are incredibly satisfying. But who knows, maybe maybe a grand piano one day. We'll see. Well, if folks want to start um, lining up in front of the mic to ask any questions, uh, please do. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your uh, writing with Parks and Rec and, and how that evolved. Was it something that you had been asking for? You wanted to kind of try it out, or did it just come to be? Uh, I, I let my boss know early on. Um, I went in and said, I just want to let you know that if you have ever, ever have anything more for me to do, because like, I come from this theater company in Chicago where I generally would build the set and I would make the props with, with help. I mean, it, it wasn't... It's always a wonderful collaboration, but I was the technical director of the company. I had all the tools. I was a makeup artist. I was a fight choreographer. Um, and, and so when I get with a group and we love making some sort of entertainment together and they just want me to show up and like crack wise and then go back to my trailer, I, uh, it's not how I'm trained. I'm like, well, I'm just sitting in my trailer. Is there something else I can be doing? You know, can I, can I sew buttons on something? And... Uh, 
so I told my boss early on that like if there's anything else I could do, and um, and we just we love making each other giggle, and so uh, it was a couple summers ago we were during the off time we had lunch. And he asked me if I wanted to write an episode, and I totally started crying in the middle of this, in the middle of this restaurant. Where I was like, "Yes, yeah, so that would be fine with me." <laughs> um, and I said, "I said, I, I, of course, I would love to, but why? Like, you can get the greatest. You know, people really love our show and, and hold it at a at a very high level." Um, you can get the greatest talent to write an episode. Why would you ask? this guy, and he said, you know, because I don't want to get some somebody who, you know, wrote a really funny movie, I love making the show with us, and it sort of came from the same vibe of just collaborating as a group and uh, enjoying this lucky time where we're allowed to, the freedom to make the show how we want to, and... And making the show, you know, by us is that that's something that's very much during during the sh the filming. There's a lot of collaboration there in the way in which you you actually shoot scenes and try out dialogue. How does that work? Well, you know, we're we're so spoiled because our writers' room is so brilliant that we none of us we we could be really pretty lousy actors and still come out smelling like a rose because the writing is just so good. They have that ability. We get asked a lot of questions uh, in in the the sort of bailiwick of, um, do you guys do you write everything yourselves or like did did you make up everything about Ron Swanson yourself? Because it seems so much, it seems to fit you so naturally. And that's just what great writers do is they pick out parts of your personality and then rid it rid it large um, as as a sort of cartoon. And they do it so well that people are like, oh, well, Nick obviously must have made that up because no one could think of that. But in truth, they did think of all of it. Um, and so it is, it is very collaborative. We get on set and we, we have these beautiful scripts. But then, you know, we're all goofballs with our own skill set. And so, you know, Pratt is my favorite. He uh, is such a, an amazing combination of... Um, of like a, a boyish, you know, sort of clumsy child combined with, he, like, don't let him fool you, he is a fucking genius when it comes to, when it comes to, like, coming out of left field with improvisation. Nobody, I mean, Amy's just a, an amazing, like, Amy is a, a corporation all in, of her own. She's like a, a comedy factory. But Pratt's sitting over there, just waiting for for the camera to throw to him, and he he floors us uh, with his cleverness so frequently. But everybody does. I mean, everybody has their own flavor, and um, and so that just when you when you start with a great script and then have all of these home run hitters sort of throwing in their their uh, additional ingredients, it just makes it for an incredibly fun collaboration. And it sounds like everyone trusts everyone to kind of step it up, and and because it's so fun. They just dive in with the best of what they've got. It is, yeah. It's a very safe environment. Um, Greg Daniels sort of learned this system on, on the American office. Uh, R.I.P. I, I uh, had my life was completely changed by that show. And he, he learned, he created this paradigm wherein when we started our show on the very first day, he said, this is very important, everybody. If you ever feel like you want to do anything or say anything, you can. You have permission. Um, it's we're, you know we're no longer shooting on film. We can shoot all day. We don't have to cut the cameras. So if you feel like getting up and going over there and making a sandwich, you can. You know as long as it's natural and it feels like it's part of the scene. And so the first couple episodes, then of course, have just hours of masturbation. Where I was like, well, Greg said it would be cool <laughs> if I go over here and take my pants off. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the edits started to come in, and, and you know, we're, we're shooting hours and hours of footage for a 21 and a half minute episode. And so we quickly learned, like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe that's uh, a yeah. little indulgent. How to make friends with the editors. Yeah, exactly. Hi, welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, I had a question. You mentioned the writers kind of pick up on aspects of your personality uh, to, to build the Ron Swanson character, and, and you yourself just a moment ago 
said you were really interested in Teddy Roosevelt and the Ernest Shackleton kind of quote unquote rugged individualists. And I think Ron Swanson falls into kind of a subcategory of that. I'm wondering what draws you to those characters. Gosh, um, I don't know. I, I uh, grew up in, in a farm family in Illinois and they are certainly rugged individualists. Uh, I grew up in the 70s, and, and we were uh, not doing great. And so there was a lot of uh, f pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and flying by the seat of our pants. And then we got into um, a more sort of middle-class existence and then, and then sort of got swept up with the, the rest of a lot of our society into an incredibly comfortable world. And I think that I just personally long for... Uh, I, I would rather not be inside in the air conditioning. I would much rather be in a canoe on a river, even if there are mosquitoes or even if it is a little scary. That just feels more alive. Um, and in the career that my, uh, my tool set led me on, I, I never imagined that I would become a, a performer. It, it was going into the arts was unheard of in my little farm town. But not, inexplicably, I, I managed to do it anyway. And, um, and that always necessitated being in an urban area. Like, uh, I went into theater, so you had to be someplace where there's an audience. Um, and, I, and so as, as I've lived in cities, I always yearned for the sort of canoe of my youth. And I think that's a lot of what led me to maintain my wood shop. It makes me feel like I'm, I can still hold my head up around the farmers in my family who are... So badass. I mean, when people ask me, like, if, if, I'm, if I'm manly or what do I think about manliness, I say, I'm the sissy in my family. I, I'm the one that went and took ballet in college. <laughs> Go talk to my uncles who are still, like, welding their own corn wagons out of scraps around the shop. And so uh, I, I think in, in the world of what I do for a living, I, I like to choose things. I would much rather go shoot something where I'm playing a lumberjack and I'm getting to spend a few months out in the woods, even though I'm going to work, uh, it's much more that's much more delicious to me than working in like a sound stage. Um, and you know, I uh, the 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 place that our country is in right now, um, I often w whenever I get riled up, certainly during like election years, and I I, I want to do something or I want to make a difference, I always have to say, well, the thing I can do. I think the most effectively is reach the audience that I already have in place. And so I try to choose subject matters and, and characters and stories that I think can have a positive influence. And uh, my American Ham show, I talk a lot about encouraging people to be more of a rugged individualist. Even if you live in the city, you can you can now become a blacksmith on your back porch or you can you know, set up a, a knitting business and sell thing on et things on Etsy. And I, I feel like that is the kind of thing that's going to help us uh, keep from being squashed by China uh, if we're going to succeed in doing that. So. Thank you. You bet. Hi. Um, so I, I love the show. And one of my favorite uh, parts of Parks and Rec is, like, the Jerry jokes. And I was wondering how, um, like, Jim O'Hare is in, like, real life. I don't talk about Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. And, um, well, I was just curious, like, are those jokes written in the script? Or, like, is it, does it just kind of happen? Uh, no, actually. We secretly hate him. And, uh, <laughs> no, we have to, Jim O'Hare is... The sweetest, the this greatest guy, and he, you know, he's he's in his in his early fifties or his late forties, uh, and he he's worked, you know, steadily as just a character actor. And for a guy like me or Jim, who's been in town, been in the business for so long, to land a spot on a show like this, you could you could literally like punch me in the balls every scene and I'd be like I don't care <laughs> I'm so happy that I'm on a show this good I don't you can have my testicles <laughs> I, it's worth it and and Jim talks a lot about that that he's like are you kidding like I've, I, I've got such a great part on this funny show but we do have to be careful the rest of us not to let it bleed over because it's 
There is so, it's so delicious. The whole <laughs> shitting on Jerry and like Jerry <laughs> as the Eeyore of the of the group. Um, we do have to remind ourselves, and I'll I'll send him random texts that I'm just like, hey Jim, it's Nick. Just want to tell you, I really love you. I think you're great. <laughs> because I because otherwise we it's so de- delicious and like it, it's so naughty, you know that <laughs> that we start like um. There, there's a story coming up, which it's hardly a spoiler to say some some bad some bad things happen to Jerry. Uh, Jerry gets some bad news, and we played this gag on him like the whole the producers and everybody. We all just started pretending that he was being like killed off the show, <laughs> and we started sending him messages of like, uh, "Hey Jim, I I have to tell you I've loved working with you," <laughs> and. I really think you, we had a great run, and I, I hope you'll come back and visit us next year. And like, we we all, st- and then we're like, okay, you guys, we can't be mean to Jim, like he's Jerry. So I mean, he take he, he's he, he takes it all in stride, and we all have a lot of fun, but we do have to be careful because he he's the sweetest. He's an amazingly wonderful, <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> Would you? Which that that engenders that sense of humor. I mean, when I meet people and they're incredibly like nice and soft spoken and shy, it makes me immediately want to be shitty to them <laughs> in a funny way. And I, I let them know that it's my way of saying I like them, but I'm like, hey, p- keep it down. We shut up, please. You're you're disrupting the room to the shy retiring person. Thank you. You bet. Hey, I uh, recently bought tickets to Sasquatch and noticed that you were on the bill for that and was curious how you prepare for an audience or like a setting like that or have you ever done any big festival-ish kind of shows before? I've done my show in a couple comedy festivals in Austin last year and in Chicago, but they were still like just me in a theater. Right. And so it, it was no different really other than maybe a slightly more drunk audience than usual. I'm a little... Uh, I'm a little curious myself because a couple friends of mine are also doing it that are stand-ups and they said that I'm going to be in like a comedy tent and it's and I'm just envisioning I'm very excited to see the gorge uh it's supposed to be the most beautiful outdoor music venue in uh in Washington is it in Yeah, it's outside Seattle, like an hour and a half. East. Yeah. It's yeah. over the the mountains. Right, uh, right, right. Um and I'm a little nervous about being in an outdoor comedy tent. I'm envisioning hearing like Cypress Hill right. playing a couple hundred yards away and I'm not sure if they made the and count. my show is kind of thoughtful and kind, you know it's funny but it's like okay we're going to talk about some serious shit and it it I I think I depend on the silence <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm going to be putting some thought into like upping the energy and like what's yeah. up everybody <laughs> I so uh, your guess is as good as mine I, I heard from some people, is it true that you can only buy like the whole pass to that thing and it's like 400 bucks? Yeah, they used to sell single day back a while ago, but now you have to buy like a four day pass. That's, That's terrible. It. That's all the festivals are going these days, yeah. I'd, I'm, I'm new to the whole thing. I, I mean, I went to Lollapalooza in like 96, I think, <laughs> which is fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Chili Peppers were the big, uh, the big like, do you, headliner. Do you plan on being there for the whole like weekend and seeing some acts? Or are you just going to do your, your show? I just went one day. Oh, for Sasquatch? Yeah, like, are you just going to be there for My your show? My wife and I are doing a play in Los Angeles that we're, uh, we had booked Sasquatch before then. So we're keeping the booking, but it's the kind of thing where we're going to have to fly, fly in and do the day and then leave, unfortunately. Gotcha. So we we're, we will do peyote while we're there. Well, that, but that's, that's encouraged. Thanks. I'd like to do the full three day, the whole vision quest, but I w- <laughs> maybe next year. Cool. I think we've got time for two more questions. So I, I was wondering, um, how does your Midwest background, you know, influence your your time on Parks and Rec? Like, was that the the dream casting for you, or do you um, throw some Midwestisms in, in there? Uh, interestingly, I mean, I think. I think it has a profound influence uh, that that um, is is subliminal, or or is, it's not something that I'm that I'm cognitive of. Uh, it's what got me the part, probably. Um, it's funny though, like when I read the script and and they started talking to me about the role, 
I showed up in jeans and like a flannel shirt, and I was and I pictured a guy. They're like this guy runs the parks department. And I was like, fantastic. I, I drive a dark green pickup truck, and I and I wear work boots and I use a shovel. And they're like, oh no, it's a it's a it's a city. It's a small city, so you wear shitty clothes from J.C. Penney, <laughs> and you work in at City Hall. And I was like, oh wow, okay. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll be cool with that. But I, and so I think just um, by using my natural, you know, Illinois demeanor, uh, <laughs> it, it, seem, it seems to be working out effectively, but I, I don't really, I mean, we talk about things. I, I pitch uh, the, the uh, scouting episode where Leslie and I each had scouts and the basketball team with the Pyramid of Greatness, those... Those both came from me saying, and it literally is this simple, where I'm like, can I please have a troop of scouts? <laughs> that, you know, that's, I, I take things from my youth uh, that I think could, could provide comedy, or can I please coach a group of boys in basketball or baseball? And then the writers take it, and they always extrapolate my, my simple idea into something much more complex and delicious that I could not... Uh, they always put a twist on it where I'm like, of course, I'll be badass and I'll cook steaks over a fire. And they're like, no, you'll suck. And Leslie will have, like, they always come up with a, a much better twist on whatever my initial thing is. But beyond that, you know, I keep saying there's a ridiculous, uh, the, 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 the show is ridiculously bereft of fishing. There needs to be a hell of a lot more fishing on the show. But L.A. doesn't have a lot of great fishing locations uh, that can pass for Indiana. So hopefully we'll remedy that in the near future. So they do turn to you for kind of a Midwest gut check sometimes? Uh, some, but, you know, uh, our, one of our main producers, Morgan Sackett, is from Iowa. Like, there's, there's enough of a Midwestern sensibility that, you know, the, it's, it's, not, it's not cloaked information. People have a pretty good idea of, of what's going on. Uh, the, but they will say, you know... Things come up like, do you guys say soda or pop or just stuff like that, and and you find that that's incredibly regional anyway. So, it, you know, if uh, people from Muncie will complain if you say it like people from Indianapolis. So, you, you're screwed no matter what you do. Uh, so we've got a bottle of Lagavulin here. Can we interest you in a drink? Christ Almighty. <laughs> I, I would, uh, I, I will not allow this occasion to go by without imbibing, but I, uh, I'll make it a small drink because I have to keep my wits about me for 3,000 people this evening. <laughs> by all means. Actually, on, on that note. Um, I see three glasses, but, and I see a great many people. <laughs> The, yeah, the keg's in the back. We also have some, uh, some parting gifts that... Um, God damn. Google's all right. We, we, uh, you guys should stick around. I think you're going places. We hope they can inspire you. Wow. For, you know, if, you're, if you have any downtime and need to... Um, that could have been really ugly. This, this is a wooden carved android. And wow. And one for Megan. Thank you so much. Yeah. She's going to love that. And I love it, too. <laughs> I love cute things. Thank you. That's a beautiful amount. <laughs> when I showed up the first time Ron had scotch on the show, there was a bottle of Lagavulin sitting on my desk, and I said, these people are so goddamn good, they found out what my favorite scotch is, because it, it was a little, little more obscure four and a half years ago. And a year later, at Mike Schur's birthday party, somebody brought him a bottle of it, and I said, oh, great gift. Uh, my, uh, you know, Ron's drinking Lagavulin because that's my favorite scotch. And he said, no, you idiot. That's his favorite scotch because it's my favorite scotch. <laughs> Which was a, a delicious piece of serendipity. <laughs> to comedy. Okay. Well, once again, on, on behalf of, uh, of Google and the San Francisco office, thanks so much <laughs> for coming by. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You just talk about some other shit now. <laughs>
Thanks very much, you guys. Yeah.